By the Great Horn Spoon, by Sid Fleischman. By the Great Horn Spoon, by Sid Fleischman, illustrated by Eric von Schmidt. By the Great Horn Spoon, favorite expression of the 49ers. Chapter 1 The Stowaways. A sailing ship with two great side wheels went splashing out of Boston Harbor on a voyage around the Horn to San Francisco. Below decks, in the creaking darkness of her cargo hold, there sat 18 barrels of potatoes. Inside two barrels, side by side, there squatted two stowaways. It was not once upon a time. It was precisely the 27th day of January in the year 1849. Gold had been discovered in California some 12 months before, and now, in a rush, the gold rush was on. The good ship Lady Wilma, overcrowded and heavy in the water with cargo, thrashed her way to the sea. Her paddle wheels churned and her smokestack stained the frozen winter sky like ink. She was bound for gold fields with 183 passengers, not counting the stowaways. Hundreds of gold seekers had been left at the dock clamoring for passage. The California fever was sweeping through the cities and towns and villages like a heady wind. Men were buying picks and shovels and trying to get from the east coast to the west as soon as possible and all at once. On the second day at sea, just after dawn, the lid rose silently off a potato barrel. Cautiously, a man raised his eyes above the rim of the barrel to look about. Slowly, he unfolded his long arms and legs. Then he stood, an elegant gentleman in a black broadcloth coat. He would be the first to admit that being folded up in a barrel with a bowler hat balanced on his knees was not the most comfortable way to travel. Now he brushed off the hat and placed it smartly on his head. He hooked a black umbrella on his arm, for he never traveled without it and pulled on a pair of spotless white gloves. He felt very nearly frozen solid, but permitted himself a most contented smile. Then he gave a small tap to the barrel beside him. All clear, Master Jack. Is that you, praiseworthy? Came a young muffled voice from the depths of a barrel. Your obedient servant, the man replied and lifted the lid. There rose from this barrel a schoolboy of twelve. He had been sucking a raw potato to slake his thirst. A patch of hair fell across his forehead in a yellow scribble. He had never been so cold, hungry, or miserable in his life. On the other hand, he had never been so happy. He wouldn't have traded places with anyone. His pepper-black eyes were considerably brightened with the fever of adventure. He smelled of potatoes from head to toe. His thin nose, which was smudged, felt like an icicle, but he permitted himself a most contented smile. We made it praiseworthy, he said. We did indeed, Master Jack. Jack gazed at the dark cargo shapes piled high around them and listened to the scrape of the sea along the wooden hull. He thought of home and Aunt Arabella and the friendly blaze in the big stone fireplace. There was no turning back now. They were on their way to the gold fields. Hungry? asked Praiseworthy. I could eat, I guess, said Jack, who didn't want to give the impression that he had any complaints. Cold? I've been colder, I guess, said Jack, although he couldn't think when. I suggest we see what we can... I suggest we see what can be done about improving our accommodations, said Praiseworthy, tapping his bowler hat firmly in place. Shall we go? Go, Jack replied. Go where? He fully expected to pass the voyage below decks with the cargo. 
He had read dire accounts of the treatment handed out to stowaways on ships of the sea. Why, to pay our respects to the captain, said Praiseworthy. The captain, the words very nearly caught in his throat, but he'll put us in chains, or worse. Leave that to me, said Praiseworthy, with an airy lift of an eyebrow. Come along, Master Jack. Jack gathered courage from Praiseworthy's cool assurance. As far back as Jack could remember, he had never known anything to ruffle Praiseworthy's calm. In his black bowler hat, his black coat, and spotless white gloves, he was easily mistaken for a professional man, a lawyer, per perhaps, or a young doctor. But he was nothing of the sort. Praiseworthy was a butler. He was a butler by breeding, by training, and by choice. More than once, Jack had heard his Aunt Arabella say that Praiseworthy was the finest English butler in Boston. He had been with Jack's family since before Jack could remember. It seemed to him there had always been a Praiseworthy. The ship gave a lurch, and the stowaways, gathering up their two carpet bags, picked their way through the darkened passages of the hold. Jack saw barrels of smoked fish bound for San Francisco. There were thousands of feet of lumber and enough bricks to build a hotel. He saw boxes of rifles and two brass cannons to fight off wild Indians, he supposed, and he could make out wet bundles of grape cuttings, enough to paint, enough to plant a vineyard. With his heart thumping, Jack followed Praiseworthy up a ship's ladder to the creaking deck above. He was sure the captain would put them in chains at the very least. Now the whistling of the wind came to them, and the thrashing of the great side wheels seemed as loud as thunder. They found themselves in the cruise quarters, where daylight barely penetrated. A sailor with the gold ring dancing in his ear was filling a lamp with whale oil. "'My good fellow,' said Praiseworthy, "'can you direct me to the captain?' The sailor looked up with a curious squint, and the ring in his ear did a jig. The wild bull of the seas? Aye, mates. He lifted a wet thumb as a pointer. Up there! Up there they went, climbing another ladder to another deck. And now Jack was sure the captain would have them walking the plank, at the very least. Wild bull of the seas! But praiseworthy was a match for anyone, he told himself, and tried to keep a straight and firm jaw. They entered the main saloon, where shivering passengers were swarming like bees around two pot-bellied stoves. Everyone seemed to be talking at once and saying the same thing. You've been hogging that stove long enough. I got here first. Let me in, partner. Jack saw men of every description, and some who defied description. There were lanky farm boys in rough boots and dandies in tight pantaloons. There were, say, there were Yankees in beaver hats and Southerners in planters' hats. There were tradesmen and politicians, Frenchmen and Dutchmen, fat men and thin ones, gentlemen and scoundrels, with not a woman among them. They were bound for the gold fields, which was no place for women and children. Give me a turn at that stove, gents. Stop pushing, sir. Praiseworthy tapped the nearest gold seeker on the shoulder, a frock coated man with a sword cane, and inquired, Can you direct me to the captain, sir? The man lifted his sword up and pointed, Up there, up there, he snapped and returned to the fray. In due time, after climbing another ladder, the two stowaways found the captain in his cabin, with the door banging open and shut with the roll of a ship. He had just come in from deck, and his wet oilskins lay in a heap. The wild bull of the seas, his legs apart, he stood bent over a long table. He was trying to thaw the ice in his curly black whiskers over a lighted candle. Well, don't just stand there inviting in the weather, he said in a voice like the roar of a cannon. Come in! The butler shut the door, only to have it fly open again. Praiseworthy at your service, sir, he said, and this young gentleman is Master Jack Flagg of Boston, who seeks his fortune in the gold fields. Bah! The shipmaster, the ship's master, whose name was Joshua Swain, hardly bothered to look up. 
it was hard to tell whether he was a good man in a bad temper or a bad man in a good temper. He had a plump nose and wore a long blue coat with a row of brass buttons the size of gold pieces. The Lady Wilma pitched and rolled, and the candlestick slid from one end of the long table to the other. Captain Swain caught it just in time. Blasted weather! he growled, and me racing the sea raven around the horn, me, with my hold of bricks and twice as many passengers as I ought to carry. But I'll beat the sea raven by grabs if I have to throw the extra passengers aboard. The door banged shut, and Jack, now wide-eyed, stared at the ship's master as if he were a stout devil in, a, in brass buttons and frozen whiskers. He would give them the plank for sure. Again, the ship lurched. The candlestick flew, but this time, praise where they caught it midair. Allow me, sir, he said, and held the candle firmly under the captain's stiff whiskers. But the wild bull of the seas wouldn't stand still, and Praiseworthy was soon following him as he paced the cabin. Do you know what the sea raven carries in her cargo holds? Captain, Bell Captain Swain bellowed. Miner's boots and flannel shirts and mosquito netting. Mosquito netting! She's so light in the water, her keel is hardly damp. Then he stopped to thaw his beard over the flame, and the roar went out of his voice. Ah, he sighed, and in another moment a smile appeared in the weathered creases of his eyes. That's better. Now then, gentlemen, what can I do you for? Jack exchanged a quick glance with Praiseworthy, who remained perfectly at ease. We wish to report a pair of stowaways, sir, said the butler. At that announcement, the captain's smile vanished, and he exploded again. Stowaways, he roared, stowaways! By grabs, I'll skin them alive. I'll put them in chains. Where are they? In his fury, the captain almost set his whiskers aflame. Praiseworthy pinched out the candle. Standing right here, sir. Here? Where? I'll skin them alive and put them in chains. Stowaways on my ship. Where are they? Here, sir, repeated the butler. And Jack, swallowing hard, decided to make the best or, or worst of it. Standing before you, sir. It was as if, for the first time, Captain Swain noticed Jack at all. You! he bellowed, and his plump nose was red with anger. Why, you're a mere jib of a boy, a lad of ten. Twelve, sir, said Jack, but I can do a man's work, sir. By grabs, I'll make you walk the plank, both of you. If I may make an observation, said Praiseworthy, you're obviously too civilized for such pirate tricks. Bah! Permit me to explain, Praiseworthy went on. It was not our intention to defraud the shipping company the moment there was posted notice lady of the Lady Wilma's departure for California. Master Jack and I were in line to buy a ticket, but in the push and clamor for some clever cutpurse helped himself to our passage money, leaving us penniless. No doubt he bought a ticket for himself and is aboard this very ship, sir. A likely story, growled, growled the captain. An unlikely story, Praiseworthy said, but true. Naturally, we had no choice but to become stowaways. And if I might add, it is imperative, sir, that Master Jack reach the gold fields and make his fortune without delay. Bah! This California fever is spreading like the plague. New England will be left half empty in another six months by grabs. Anything with a keel is calling itself a gold ship and putting to sea. Scows with rotten bottoms, fishing trawlers, whaling ships, Argonauts of old they are, chasing after this golden fleece. Every man Jack thinks he will make his fortune. Bah! All this while, Jack Flagg stood listening, quietly listening, not only to the captain, but to the icy winds and the shrouds and ratlines. He stood straight and tried not to look afraid. He had made up his mind that he must reach the treasure streams of California one way or another. And this was certainly one way or another. 
He refused to give in to a lurking homesickness, but he found himself thinking of his two younger sisters, Constance and Sarah, left behind in Boston with Aunt Arabella. They had surely burst into tears to find him gone, run away, and perhaps they had not dried their eyes yet. But there was no help for it, he told himself. Neither Jack nor his sisters remembered their own parents, who had been taken away by cholera. The children had gone to live with their Aunt Arabella in the big house on the bay, with almost more rooms than they could count. She was as young and beautiful as the house was old and grand. It had been in the Flagg family for more than a century. In times past, the house had been filled with servants and guests and laughter, but the family had fallen upon hard times. Aunt Arabella had closed off half the rooms and no longer entertained. Of her staff, she kept only an upstairs maid, a downstairs maid, and praiseworthy. And then Jack had overheard Banker Stites tell Aunt Arabella that her inheritance was almost gone. In another year, he warned her, she would be virtually penniless. Even the house, with all its family memories, would have to be sold. I advise you to fire your remaining servants at once, Banker Stites had said. You can't afford them any more. But I couldn't do that, Aunt Arabella smiled. Why, they are like members of the family. Oh, no, I couldn't let them go. It was then that Jack knew he must help Aunt Arabella. But how? At the same time, stories drifting back from California excited everyone's imagination. He had heard of men picking up nuggets the size of goose eggs and stubbing their toes on lumps the size of pumpkins. A boy could do that, even a boy not yet 13. Without a second thought, Jack made plans to run away to the gold fields. But nothing escaped praiseworthy, and he found Jack out. Instead of informing Aunt Arabella, for she would never consent to such a venture, praiseworthy kept Jack's secret, and more. An excellent plan, he said, a worthy plan indeed, for he was as devoted to Aunt Arabella as Jack himself. I'll go with you, Master Jack. There will be a ship's passage to pay. I have a few bank notes put aside. And together, pooling savings, the boy and the butler set out for the world at large. But thanks to the light-fingered thief, the world had proved to be no larger than the inside of a potato barrel. Blast, said the captain, standing at a porthole. There's the sea raven, a beam of us now, standing there as if to thumb her nose at us. Jack got a glimpse of the other ship on a rising swell, the two-masted sidewheeler exactly like the Lady Wilma. If I may observe, Praiseworthy remarked with his perfect calm, it is a 15,000-mile voyage around Cape Horn to San Francisco, I believe. It is not the beginning of a race that counts, sir, but the end. If I win the race, I'll get command of a new clipper ship building in the yards. She'll be the prize of the seas, and I want her, sir. Captain Swain unhooked the brass voice tube and bellowed to the engine room below. More steam, sir. It's all we can do to keep up. More steam. And then he turned to the stowaways. You'll work off your passage on this ship, by grabs. You there, boy. Jack, who was already standing straight, stood even straighter. Yes, sir. You'll work as my, sh you'll work as ship's boy. I'll run your legs off, and that's letting you off easy. And you, sir, praiseworthy at your service. What in tarnation are you in that get-up? I am a butler, sir. A butler? The captain roared. A butler? What in the name of old scratch can a butler do? It's the other way around, sir, said Praiseworthy, who took pride in his calling. There's nothing a butler cannot do. I open doors, I close doors, I announce that dinner is served, I supervise the staff and captain the household as much as you do this ship, sir. A most exacting job, if I may so say so. <laughs> bah! 
And Jack ventured, "'Aunt Arabella says he's the best there is. "'She says there's no problem too big for praiseworthy. "'Silence, boy! A butler, are you? "'By grabs, I know where there's a door you can open, "'the furnace door, and you can shovel in fuel. "'To the coal bunkers with you, butler. "'Now out of my sight before I change my mind "'and put you both in chains.' "'Sir?' said Jack, trembling inwardly. "'I don't care to be a ship's boy.' What? If Praiseworthy is going to the coal bunkers, I'll shovel coal too. Jack met Praiseworthy's glance, but only for a moment. We're partners, sir. Either send me to the coal coal bunkers or, he gulped, or put me in chains. The wild bull of the sea was struck absolutely speechless. Don't pay any attention to Master Jack, said Praiseworthy quickly. That boy is light-headed from the sheer hunger, and he hasn't eaten since yesterday, and he doesn't know what he's saying. Yes, I do, said Jack. You told me yourself we'd stick together, through thick and thin. By this time, the captain had recovered his voice, and a smile lurked in his eye. By grabs, he said, by grabs. Here's a lad with stuffings. He doesn't want an easy berth, wants a man's job. All right, to the coal bunkers, both of you. Thank you, sir, said Jack, picking up his carpet bag. The captain cocked a shaggy eyebrow. It wouldn't hurt hurt none of you if you stopped first at the galley and told the cook I said to give you something to eat. A man can't shovel coal on an empty stomach, or a lad either. Now, be out of my sight. The door flew open and the stowaways withdrew. They descended one ladder and then another, got their breakfast, and reported to the engineer. He pointed out the boiler furnace, the coal bins, and the shovels. Praiseworthy removed his bowler hat, his white gloves, and the umbrella from the crook of his arm. They made a neat pile of their coats and rolled up their sleeves. Unless I miss my guess, said Praiseworthy, the wild bull of the seas is a gentleman at heart. I hope he wins the race, said Jack. The stowaways set to work shoveling coal into the yellow flames of the furnace, flames that made the steam that turned the great side wheels. Jack was either to work beside Praiseworthy, as if it brought them ever closer together. Sometimes he wished Praiseworthy were anything but a butler. It imposed imposed a slight distance between them that Praiseworthy was careful to maintain. Jack would be happy to be called Jack, just Jack, and not Master Jack. But Praiseworthy wouldn't hear of it, even though they were now partners. Praiseworthy, said Jack, wiping the hair from his forehead. He had to raise his voice above the howl of the fire and the clank of machinery. Praiseworthy, do you really believe the cut purse is aboard the Lady Wilma. I do indeed, said the butler, digging into the bunker of cold, and we shall unmask the scoundrel. But how? How? I haven't. Why, I haven't the faintest idea, Master Jack. But between us, we'll think of something by grabs. While the captain went back on deck and froze his whiskers again, while the passengers huddled around the two pot-bellied stoves, Praiseworthy whistled, and Jack hummed. They alone of the gold seekers aboard the Lady Wilma had a roaring fire to warm them as the side-wheeler went splashing through the sleet and the wind and the sea.